about how he has reached capital in his uh, organization. And uh, then we follow it up with uh, basics of investment banking and uh, where uh, one of uh, Sadish will take us through in terms of how uh, you can structure your business plan and how you pitch to an investor. And then we also have uh, uh, an investor who will take you through their perspective, what they feel is necessary, what is their perspective when they evaluate businesses. Right. So I, uh, I guess the most exciting part right now is uh, Mr. Anand Mehta. He is going to, uh, just to give you a brief about him, he, is, uh, he has a vast experience in the corporate field and uh, he works, he's worked uh, in a variety of financial spaces, spaces as well. And currently he runs his own company called the India Shelter Finance Corporation. And uh, he has worked uh, towards raising capital and forest enterprise as well and he has a vast experience in that as well. And I'd like to invite you sir to be able to give us a perspective of what were his challenges, what he went through, what was his perspective in raising the capital and I hope you, some of you find it very valuable for your enterprise Thank you. Hi. I just... Uh, Thank you. I'm hopefully unprepared for this because this is not the format I sort of came here uh, anticipating. Uh, and I don't have, I don't think I have much of right to speak to you about how to raise capital for business after reading the profile of the enterprises represented here. So I would suggest we take it in a sort of interactive format. I'll introduce myself and tell you uh, a bit about the kind of roadmap that I've been given by Satish. Uh, and I'll stick to this roadmap, but I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm an, uh, I've been a corporate creature for 25 plus years of my life. I've uh, worked with financial services companies. I've worked at uh, HDFC, uh, Bank of America, American Express, Kundish Bank, and lastly at National Bank. And uh, I always wanted to do, uh, be in the business of mortgage finance, uh, which is a uh, long term annuity kind of business, if you can take good, good, good customers, you can build a large scale business in the country, you can build an HDFC for the kind of segment uh, that you all deal with uh, here, urban, semi-urban, uh, rural uh, kind of customers are completely untouched by housing finance because the HDFCs of the world uh, do not look at this kind of customer. So there is market space uh, and that's why uh, one fine in a few weeks, I decided to stop wearing a tie ever again and got into a particular moment. So here I am. Uh, I have raised a total of about 100 crores over 6 rounds uh, for two companies. Uh, so I can claim a little bit of experience. Uh, there will be an investor speaking with you anyways. Uh, but uh, I will give you my perspective of how the investor thinks. Um, I'll tell you a bit about the process that we follow, may or may not be right, uh, but I can tell you about the process we follow, the challenges we face, uh, how to do the outreach to investors, uh, how to select the investor and what happens to your company once you are there and a few red flags that you might like to keep in mind when you are going through this process. So uh, essentially, I mean the way uh, the way we should go about building enterprises or to raise capital for enterprises was to build a petri dish model because there's nothing like uh, using your own money to build a small lab scale experiment to see if the business really works because most entrepreneurs, it happens to all of us including me, it's happened to me twice uh, before where we are so much, so passionately in romance with our own idea of what the business is and what the customer wants that we sort of stop listening to what the market is telling us, what the customer is telling us and so on. So if we uh, put our money where our mouth is and actually put in our own money to see how our business works um, and actually see revenues rolling in, we realize a lot of truths which should have been evident first, first shot if we were not in the business. But we are passionately in love with our businesses which is why we are in there. Um, so it makes sense to put in your own money, build a lab scale experiment and only then sit down to write a business plan, you know. I think the first business plan should be written in Word rather than Excel. Uh, it makes sense to just go with the idea, build a lab scale experiment and then start building the numbers because numbers uh, completely change and once you put something in an Excel, you will only change it rather than rebuild it ever. 
uh, that's my experience after doing hundreds of thousands of Excel sheets. Is that once you put something on an Excel sheet, it's very difficult to just destroy it, throw it away, you know, build it from ground up. And sometimes that's the realization that comes to us after maybe six months or a year of having been in business. So it's better to be uh, to be on a fresh sheet each time uh, when you start writing financials, and it's better to have some experience behind you of having actually earned revenues before you start doing the numbers on the plan. There are, uh, so once you are ready, you've got a business rolling on the ground, maybe a very small uh, business, but if you've got something on the ground, there are a zillion challenges as you start going uh, to investors. It is an extremely time consuming process, uh, takes away a lot of bandwidth away from the business that you are trying to build. Uh, just finding business, uh, finding investors, figuring out how to approach them, figuring out how to pitch, writing up a business plan, I see this beautiful template. But filling up this template would probably take you a good two to three months of intense effort before you can come out with something that is credible. So <coughs> it, it, the challenge is one, it takes away a lot of bandwidth from the business. Two, it takes away a lot of time from the business. Uh, but there is a big advantage that it makes you think brutally about what your business is. Does it really make money? Is it really worth somebody's why to invest in this business? So to that extent, uh, that will be useful. Uh, it makes sense to have an advisor, it makes sense to have more than one person in the business because uh, my experience has been uh, over two startups and banks and you know, two businesses has been that it makes sense to have two lead partners in any business. That you have one person who actually concentrates on the operating part of it and the other partner who actually concentrates on getting the raw material to build the business. Because <coughs> These are two very different kind of scales and sometimes you know if you try doing both you are doing a Herculean job uh, which becomes a bit difficult to live this schizophrenic existence of one selling a story, like it or not, you are selling a story. When you sell to an investor, you are selling a fantasy, uh, we may all like to believe in all we do, pitch sincerely, right? we believe in our business and we believe in the numbers we present, but the numbers in the, in the, in the, in the in the process of being polished, end up at a place where they are not real. And it's perfectly alright to sell a story which at this time does not sound real because you are staking yourself on turning what is not real into reality uh, if and when you get the money to actually scale up the business. So it does make sense to have uh, two people, one person who concentrates only on it and spins out of the business with a clear roadmap saying that you know once the first shot is done. This person will spin out of the business and the business will take its own life and the operating partner will actually become the business. Uh, <coughs> second challenge is find, finding who to, who to approach and how to approach them. Makes sense to have a banker on your side, an investment outfit, uh, could be a small investment outfit or you could go to the bigger firms or uh, everyone has to take size limitations. So it's better to have somebody who's already in the market, who have the network, because rather than doing internet searches and figuring out who's what and you know what kind of projects to the look at, internet doesn't tell you one tenth of the story. Uh, ideally, it has to be someone who's dealt with these folks before, who knows them well, and who has person-to-person -person contacts. Because every investor is snowed under with investment propositions. Everybody's got a gold-making machine. So you go to social investors or you go to the sequoias of the world. Uh, they get probably 20 proposals a day and I am talking about the big guys, they get 20 proposals a day. Even IntelliCap I am sure hits at least 50-60 proposals every month if not more, uh, probably more. And just separating the you know useful ones from the chat uh, is a full time job which no inv and investors are time Nazis. They are you know very very brutal with their time. They manage their time very, very well. And uh, it makes sense to have somebody on the side who will be able to open the door for you, connect you with the right person, and get you going fastest. Because otherwise, you'll be ending up you know, banging your head against a wall for a long time. You touch 20 guys, maybe five of them were very good, but you didn't have the in on them and you won't shake their hand. And those are the really worthwhile investors that you really want to approach. So it makes sense to have a bank that will give you references will open doors for you and will be able to tell you about the investors that they are taking you to. So that is I think a very very important thing. 
The second part of this same thing is communication. You know, we communicate our passion when we write our pitch or our business plan. We communicate our passion. We do not look at it from the investor's perspective. Most investors are pretty smart. They can figure uh, your passion versus the real business. But it makes sense to invest a lot of time in ensuring that all the non-necessary stuff is not in your business plan or in your pitch. The investor wants to concentrate on two, three, four big messages, and those big messages, at least from what I have seen, uh, so I should tell you exactly what they are. But in my mind, those four, five big messages are one that you are dealing with a large market, you should be able to prove it within one slide that the market is large. Two, that you have something special to offer to this market, which is either as yourself, as if your own experience. Uh, or with the product uh, offering you have, or with the service offering you have, the way you deliver the product. There are three or four things which should justify your right, your having earned the right to be in that business. Uh, third is the size of the opportunity. Where, you know, I mentor a few people and then I get their business plans, you know, third, fourth year you're looking at revenues of, yesterday I met someone who had fourth year revenues of 10 crore rupees. Now, no investor, this pop, less than pocket change for an investor. So, no investor is going to put their money in that kind of business plan. No institutional investor. So, I think it makes sense to uh, do your numbers well enough to be able to sell the plan. Size is a very, very, very important act. No point taking a boutique business plan to someone which is not good people being selling up. Every investor from the day you meet him is thinking about how he's going to exit from the business. You will not be able to exit if the business is not of a critical size or cannot be scaled up to a critical size in a reasonable time frame. Most funds, most LPs invest for 5 to 7 years. Uh, social impact investors do it for a slightly longer period of uh, But still, the life of most private equity investments will not be more than 5 to 7 years. 5 also is stretching it a bit. 7 you have to be very, very lucky. So, uh, try to show something to the investor which proves to him that he will be able to exit uh, within 3, 4, 5 years uh, recently. Uh, they should be able to exit. Then, outreach. Once you've got the pitch and plan ready, my suggestion is approach the most unlikely investors first. Because you get a free test of your business plan. They will tear it apart, they will do whatever. And your first round should be just to test. These are investors who you don't want to take money from or these are investors who you know are not going to invest in. Take it to them because they are all very smart folks. All investment guys in whichever company, whichever fund are terribly smart people. And they do a great job on analyzing business plans and giving you feedback. So it makes a lot of sense to use the, that opportunity of burning bridges with one or two folks taking your plan to them, finding their time, spend 2, 3, 4, 5 hours or a couple of visits to your business and let them tear it apart. After that is when you will really get ready with a plan that is saleable. So it makes a lot of sense to subject yourself to that surgery, it's brutal, but it makes a lot of sense to do it. Uh, it will mean 2, 3 meetings, it will mean visits, it will mean some investment, but highly, highly recommended, highly worth it. Um, <coughs> And after that, you should select uh, with your banker or by yourself. Select a short list of guys you want to take your plan to. Because it's a small world; they all talk to each other. Uh, and if your plan is, you know, spread around like confetti, everybody and his mom has got it. Uh, so everybody is made up their minds. Best is to take it to a select group with the perfected pitch, which is pitch, which is true to the particular investor you are taking it to. It does not make sense to spread it. I, I have seen some people have sent their business plan to a huge BCC mailing list. Now 20, 30, 40 people. Every fund they could find on the internet, their plans there. And if there are 50 guys looking at a plan, they got 50 different ideas. One guy burns you, you are burned in that community. So it makes sense to spread it carefully first. It's only when you get desperate that you really spread it in broadcast mode. Until then, just stay quiet, uh, keep it to a few people, keep it to a controllable kind of population because they will take your time. You know, if there are 20 guys, if nothing else, they will want a one hour phone call. 
Uh, if they are interested, they will probably visit you and take away half your day. If they are more interested, they could take away three to five days before they say yes, no, or you know that they don't want to do it. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to be very limited in your approach as you go first round. And then you know if it's a tough kind of business, it's difficult to explain, difficult to understand. It's possible you have to go into a broadcast mode, uh, but that should come as a last resort, uh, not in the first shot. People think just because they have sent to 50 guys, they will get a quick investment. That doesn't happen in this world. Uh, it will, it's only going to hurt you. Uh, before, after, uh, is something Sadish will ask me to speak about in each company. Uh, before is very easy. You know, you've got a one-man show. You can pretty much do what you want. Uh, you have complete freedom. You write your own checks and do your work. Uh, but once the investor comes in. Uh, <coughs> one, they bring in a lot of positives. Uh, they make you think about the business as not your own persona. They make you think about the business as a separate entity. One. Two, they bring a lot of networks to the table. They bring an outside foil to everything you do. But what, what sounds perfectly sensible to ourselves, if a second guy has said it, there are angles which you haven't thought of, which suddenly pop out of nowhere. So that is the second thing that happens. Third, a strong element of formality comes into the business where you have a you know reserved items list in your board of some 20 things which you can't do without <coughs> the investor approval. Uh, there are uh, you have to have your board meetings, you have to have your monthly update calls, depending on who your investor is and how much time are they going to invest in the business. Uh, but there will be a lot of obligations you will have of having formality to the business, uh, not being able to be as free as you were. Um, having to take the three guys approval, concurrence, etc., before you can move a figure on many things uh, like some hiring, investment calls, uh, pricing, um, discounting, um, a lot of things. I mean, the, even the best agreements I've seen have a minimum of a dozen reserved items. Um, our own last shareholder agreement has, I think, 19 reserved items, which pretty much covers. A huge swathe of business on you know what you can or can't do without uh, approvals from investors. Uh, some red flags. Uh, what started happening is a lot of investors, uh, you know, their interest ID in the ideal world. I hope there's no investor here. In the ideal world, their interests have to be aligned with the entrepreneur's interest. But uh, you know, some shareholder agreements uh, that you hear of or you see these days have the equity element. Investor is putting in equity, he is not putting in a debt. And equity uh, investment is attracting a lot of debt like clauses, which says you will buy back my shares at X price at such and such time, or that I can sell you to your competitor without your approval. So, you know, yes, you need the money. Yes, we all need the money as we have businesses. Uh, but I don't think we have to lie down and be walked over. So it makes a lot of because you know a lot of guys will say customary agreements. Now, customary anything can be customer. And what is customary? Who's custom? Which custom? I would ideally uh, advise you all to be very careful about this customary business because you know when you are talking to their lawyers and we are talking to their uh, finance folks, they will say, oh, this is customary, it happens in every agreement. Don't believe that. There is nothing which happens in every agreement, you can fight on every night. And you should. Uh, don't do anything stupid, don't get into obligations of buying back your own equity. But it's a business. It may or may not fail. Right? Hopefully it won't. Uh, but in case it does, you should not be under any obligation to cover the investor for his potential losses. Uh, don't give up your rights uh, to be able to fight them in the boardroom. Don't give up your rights because they will, they will, they always say this one is customary. Second is it's there, everything is just a formality. It's there, you know. But suddenly one day, when things are not all right, uh, you know, every word becomes important. So it makes a lot of sense to have a good lawyer by your side, retained by you, not retained by the investor. That money is good money, and that money should be spent by every uh, entrepreneur. To ensure that their interests are protected. Don't, don't put your personal finances and families at stake by, uh, by giving in to any of those because you have a choice of investors just like he has a choice of investments. 
you have a choice of investors too. So uh, don't get desperate. Uh, and uh, third, one very counterintuitive thing is that you know don't worry about dilution. If you have to dilute sixty percent in your company, you have to but raise when you need to raise five rupees, please raise six. Because when we build our business plan, we have some of us who come from the corporate world, who work with companies, always learn to sandbag things. And it makes sense to sandbag, but it makes sense to always take a little more capital, dilute a bit more than what you think you will need. Because in the real world, you are hit by surprises all the time. Uh, Non-investor people are going to suggest you don't dilute too much. But you cannot dilute too much one by asking for a crazy valuation and getting it. Uh, and getting the money you need. Uh, second, you can you know dilute but still have all the money you need and to build a good business because you will have stumbles along the way, you will discover new things along the way, and you will end up spending more than what you thought you would. Always, always, always. Uh, very few lucky people who uh, don't end up spending 125% of what they started up with. So, raise a little more than what you think you need. Uh, be very uh, inner about it. Be, uh, and do, do take care of yourself. You know. Investors can say what they will. And they will always tell you as if they will walk away tomorrow if you don't agree. No investors are going to walk away. Once they have invested 10, 12, 15 years of their time, they are not going to walk away. They have invested already. Right? So, don't believe this walk away business. Nobody walks away. People are going to stick around. Uh, it's only when you are desperate and you fail everywhere that you think the real walkaway can happen. In all other situations, walkaways don't happen. So my thing is, call that bluff, stay, stay your ground, uh, stick to what you think you want and don't give in to unreasonable demands. There are some reasonable demands, you know, he wants to control each time, you want to hire a senior guy, perfectly legitimate, no problem, we will agree, you will interview, I do, because to an extent his interest is mine. But Things like I will be able to sell you at any time, at any price to a competitor because consolidation is the easiest way to exit. Hardly any businesses are going to exit out through the IPO mode in this country. That will take a long time to happen. So it will always be a strategic sell. So there are a few things which you must be careful about. There should be no buy buy clauses in the thing. In your investment agreement, there should never be a, never be a uh, sale, you know, there will be a trade sale clause, there will be a big trade sale clause which says to who you can sell and how. So that trade sale clause is very important for all of us who are in businesses which will not IPO uh, in the foreseeable future. So there will always be a trade sale, but the trade sale should not be with no recourse to you or no recourse for you. Uh, the trade sale has to happen with your complete agreement and you have to get your rightful share of the trade sale. The I, last one I saw one shareholder agreement, it says, you know, the investor will get his 3x before the entrepreneur gets one cent. So even if your shares have to be sold to get his 3x, he has to get his 3x. That's an unfair cross to my mind at least. So you should not agree to it. This investor might be agreed that it will be proportionate whether they make their 3x or they don't. So it's an equity investment, they are taking a risk, you are taking a risk, you put your own money in. And uh, there you go. So don't give entries to uh, in the in the hunger to make money, uh, to get the money, don't give up uh, easily on, uh, on these. And generally, after life is not very different. Uh, you are sitting on a lot of money in your bank. Spend it very carefully. The temptation is that you know now we are comfortable. Let's hire some more expensive people. Let's have a few MIS folks and so on. Continue behaving the way you do with your own money. Makes sense to conserve it. Cash is key. Having cash in the bank. There is no better business proposition than cash in bank. So have cash in bank, uh, spend it very, very carefully, uh, keep your investor on your side. It's good to keep them over informed rather than under informed. So it makes sense to inform the your lead investor or investors or as often as you can. Uh, ideally a monthly call is not a bad idea. At least one face to face meeting every quarter is not a bad idea. So, because the investor is on board, he suddenly doesn't get surprises, you know, six months, eight months, ten months down the line. So, it makes a lot of sense to give them excessive information rather than too little information. So, that's it. Questions? Uh, 
when you are trying to get an investor to invest in the equity, and when your equity is, you know, proportionately a small equity, and the investment that you are asking is much larger, how does it work? Like, you know? See, we uh, when we raised a personal equity for this company, between nine people, uh, we had uh, just three crores, and we raised uh, twenty-five crores. This round we raised another, so we raised a total of seventy crores. And the entrepreneurs, the lead founders of the company, are only six percent of the company. So effectively, I put in sixty lakh rupees, uh, and my co-founders put in another sixty, and we raised seventy crores from investors. One is asking for a rightful valuation. You put in your money when it was highly risky. Now this guy is coming in when there is some business on the ground. So ask for a valuation. We ask first round when we raised, we asked for a valuation of sixty crores on a company which. I had just three crores. We had just three crores. We asked for a sixty or crore valuation. Yeah, and we said we will dilute fifty percent. So they got forty-eight uh, percent of the equity for twenty-five crores. Uh, so you can, you know, that is all. You can also depend on how attractive your business is. Believe your business is very attractive, and ask for a sky-high value. Say I want to have X percent stake. My business, and I need X amount of money to. Put. They've got people like Satish are sitting there to do the math. You know, you should be sure that you know I want 25 crore rupees. I have only a crore, and I have created this out of a crore. Now you pay me 25, and I still get to keep 50 percent. You can't do stupid things, but at the same time, there's sometimes sometimes you know on the face of it, it's stupid because in fact I would have actually sold our company first round for just a 15 crore valuation. We were running short of money. We, uh, I was running with exactly what you just said, saying, "Yeah, we have so little money. How can we ask for so much?" But uh, my co-founder is a much harder nose guy than I am, and he said, "Look, it doesn't matter. Our company is worth 60 crores, so we will go ask for 25 crores and give them only 50 percent." So we didn't get 60; we got 50, but we still got 25 crores for a 48 percent valuation. You can get it. I mean, it's not unheard of, especially in early stage. You can get uh, pretty good valuation. Still get to keep a lot. Even if you don't get to keep a lot, ask for a big uh, stock option plan, which will rest as you build the company. Now, another thing, don't agree to play crazy milestones. You know, sometimes you know investors do these staggered investments, and they put milestones. And uh, we have our own fanciful ideas about. So always dilute your milestone. Whatever you think you're going to achieve, dilute it by 50 percent and commit to those milestones. 50 percent is my suggested number. Uh, take that 50 percent. I think it's a very good number, 50 percent. So whatever you think you're going to achieve, dilute your milestone by 50 percent and say here is what you're going to achieve. It's better to bust it because those milestones. Because you know, within the investors' world, a lot of things can change. Two years down, when the time comes to invest more money. Uh, and if their outlook on the sector has changed, uh, like micro finance, outlook on the sector has changed. So guys who are committed to second round and third round investments on achievement of certain milestones have suddenly become very, uh, you know, hard nosed about it, saying, I, in their own meeting rooms, they are saying we are not going to put in any more money in financial services. Outside to you, they are saying, oh well, we haven't achieved the milestone. So the best thing is to. Uh, One ideally don't have a milestone big thing. Don't have option overhangs like they say. Uh, don't get committed to taking in more money and parting with more equity uh, down the line. Uh, take the round and say we will talk again. We will have the first right of refusal whenever it comes. But don't leave the option overhangs. We suffered. Uh, we come back in one case where we had an option overhang, and it becomes a big problem because the investor that's incumbent becomes a dog in the manger. He will. Do. You know, they do all the tough time and make you run around, and uh, he will want to be in every conversation you have with anybody else. So don't have options over that. Take a round and be quiet. So what exactly is the company is? We are in housing finance. Housing finance. We are in which job? Low, low to middle. My borrowers are basically charges demand. No, we are lower line. Demand is not migrated up.
Dreamo ni. You know, frankly, it's it's uh, you know. That's how you arrive at that. There are many, you know, every industry has its own. One, there are some given formula which says multiple of revenue. Now your revenue itself is a fantasy, right? Because you know revenue is a fantasy. It's basically you have to handle your way. But we have to be aggressive. But what happens is at least two times that we raise first round money, you go very defensive. When I started, you know, I used to think, you know, these guys are doing me a big favor by putting their money in my pocket. Uh, remember, he is also sitting with money in the bank. <coughs> he is gone, done roadshows all over America and Europe, raising his five hundred million dollar fund. Right now, his investors are asking him to, you know, make calls and get their money in and invest it. So he is as desperate to find good businessmen as you are to get money. So no point being. You know, being bashful and being uh, defensive about uh, taking their money, be very unashamed and you know, maybe in your face with it. There's no, there's no point being defensive. There's no point. They are not doing us a favor. It's a commercial deal. So put yourself on the same table, same chair, because you cannot deal with them like idiots. But the minute you lie down, they will walk all over you. They are happy to write a check, but they will write it on their conditions. I know one guy who's, who signed up on a buyback guarantee. The investment went bust, and the investor made him sell his house and you know everything he owned to pay him back. An equity investment. He was very good. I don't think he would do it. No, no, but no, no. I am just telling you the red flag because there are some smart dudes who are doing this. You know? So the nothing to be scared of. I think it's a great way to uh, build a business. I'm sorry if I'm scaring you, but I think it's a great way to uh, build a business is to take team. You do get a lot of strength having a good partner. You have uh, guys who have networks across industries. I'll, I'll tell you one example. Delight. You must have heard of that solar company. <coughs> Delight used to sell seven thousand five hundred likes uh, a month uh, until a year and a half, sixteen months. This morning I was talking to someone there. They said, "Oh, we have to talk to the good folks, find out everything about their background, find out how they are supported." You know, we talked to the companies where our guys had invested. We talked to three four Sequoia is very well known, very great fund, one of the best funds in the world. Uh, but we talked to a few of the investing companies before we uh, took their money. We did have choice, so we talked to two three companies. We talked to. We took the uh, a reference about the member who was going to come on our board. We took a reference about the fund, on how supportive they are, uh, how good they are, you know, how they are there, what are the wrongs and rights. You get a good reference. There is a, I'm a, a complete. I think the best way to fund a business is to be. Best way to fund a business. I'm a believer. I'm a complete believer. But uh, you know, the good everybody knows. Other, you know, before they write a check, all the other stuff also happens. You know, normally it takes it will take you about six months to actually have money in the bank from the day you start doing your outreach. It will take you six months. You effectively spend about eight months, two months in building the business plan, and six months to actually get money in the bank. So, and of that six months, about four months goes into trading the shareholder in the bank. So, getting the term sheet, getting the shareholder. So it makes a lot of sense to uh, to to uh, do your homework very very solidly, read everything word for word, and trust that everything is real. There is no such thing as formality. There is no such thing as customary. There is no such thing as indemnities. Indemnities be very careful about. Every investor will tell you, oh, our indemnity is standard. We don't change it for anyone. Can be changed. Indemnities change every day. Indemnities and warranties are the two killer portions of that agreement. So we were at trade sale for all of us. Trade sale is the third one.
you have to be very careful. If you have a good advisor, they will give you good advice. But it, remember, the interest of your advisor is not always aligned to your interest. The advisor wants to close the deal fast, get his money in and go home. So a lot depends on your relationship with the advisor. But ultimately, he is interested in getting his fees and getting on with his life. So you have to look after yourself. So hire your own lawyer. So advisors are good to have. They will do the first portion. They are very good. You know. Take their support, uh, do all you can with them. The first question, which is up to the term sheet. After that, yes, they will support you. Uh, and I am not giving a reference to it. They will support you, they are good people. They will support you, they have an in house lawyer also. So you will get some advice. But the kind of solid, strong advice you get from somebody you have retained yourself is something that nobody has given you. So retain your own lawyer. Pay they charge crazy fees, but it makes sense to pay that fee. Some of you have experience in doing this stuff, hire them and pay their fees. Have them on your side.